And so first question might be, is this another lecture about crystals capturing small molecules? What's going on here? Um, and the answer is yes, but we are using different materials than Professor Yagi. Um, we're not using MOFs, which although they are ornate and brilliant and high performance, and they're even not expensive, and have amazing pore distribution and everything like that, um, decided, we decided to think about things that are really super, super cheap, like dirt cheap, like dirt, rocks, or you know, crystals which are almost just like normal rocks that you'd find in nature. Um, and things like magnesium oxide, you know, very readily available, non-toxic, and you, I mean, you've got ionic liquids that are stable up to 400 degrees. You've got MOFs that are also stable at very high temperatures. And those are amazing materials for maybe 90% of all applications. But we do think that maybe some kind of rocks, magnesium oxide, something like that, will also have a few applications of its own. And the question is, is this a competition? Of course not, because we will never be as elegant as MOFs. Uh, we will never be as interesting as ionic liquids or nanopores. Um, molecules or particles either, um, but we might have some of our own applications. And um, before we get into those, I'd like to quickly introduce our thermochemical energy storage team at the TU Wien. Um, I'm actually here representing uh, Professor Peter Weinberger, uh, who right now is on medical leave. Um, and there we go, laser pointer. Um, and Dr. Andreas Werner is also helping us out with mechanical engineering questions. Um, and I have the immense honor not only of being here, uh, but also being entrusted with the research results of also the former PhDs of the group and postdocs. Um, and so basically, um, along with the broader scientific community, we are, we're asking ourselves, how can we use just very, very simple um, minerals, crystals, uh, things that really don't require a whole lot of ingenuity but in an ingenious way to solve problems that are facing our society. And so one question, um, how we can drive these sustainability transitions is, what can we do just with energy? If we look at energy consumption in Austria, we see that we were using the equivalent of almost 36 million tons of petroleum just a few years ago, um, and that fossil fuels represent about two thirds of our primary energy consumption. Now, um, a lot of this, just about half of it, is used for heat generation. Uh, so the heating and cooling sector plays a very important role. Um, and this is spread around about 40% to 40% in industry and households, um, whereas services and agriculture also play an important role. Um, and we see that in the industry, we have 224 petajoules. So that's 224 times 10 to the 15th, or 224 million billion uh, joules of energy being used just in Austria for heating. Uh, so this is a relevant field, and the question is, what can we do? Um, because if we have, you know, let's say lots of hydroelectric plants, like in Greifenstein, uh, then what actually happens is one of those plants can cover 0.003% of this heat demand, which is a nice start and it plays an important role, but we also need complementary technologies. Um, and we also see that if we look at the worldwide energy consumption, we've got 508 exajoules, almost one zeta joule or 10 to the 21st joules, um, and we see that about 50% of it are also used for heating and cooling. So something to do with heating and cooling, and also even just energy production with, with electricity as the main goal, has all these conversion losses, over 50% of the input energy we use to go into electricity actually ends up just as dissipi dissipated waste heat. So our question is, how can we harness this waste heat? I mean, it's being used for heating, it's being used for cooling, and it's even just being um, generated in the scope of energy production. And so the scientific community has come up with three uh, main research fields that I would like to talk about uh, just briefly. There's sensible storage, and then, I mean, those are really just normal rocks out of the ground. Um, oil or water, you can heat it up from zero to 100 degrees in the case of water, or much higher with rocks. Um, with latent storage, then we've got things like phase change materials, paraffin wax, eutectics, and they have a very specific temperature at which they store this heat. Um, 
paraffin wax might melt at 50 degrees, 80 degrees, and that's the temperature that they would be using it for. And for chemical storage, then we've got um, just two, in our, in our case, we've got two reactants, A and B, and they form substance C, and hopefully we have a nice exothermic reaction. Um, and there's things like salt hydrates or carbonates or oxides, which can partner up with a gas. So here we have a um, solid and a gas, and that's very nice because they're easy to separate. Um, so if we have chemical storage, then we just have our solid and our gas, and we store them separately. And once we want to release our heat, then we just have to unite them again. And the big advantage is if we look at uh, thermochemical energy storage, we've got much higher storage capacities than just using sensible storage. Um, but we do also have, if we're, if we're not just using rocks taken straight out of the ground, but you know, uh, some mi minerals that we have to design or choose carefully or purify, um, then we have higher material costs. Um, and we also have a relatively low technology readiness level, TRL, uh, so we're still at the university doing research here. Um, but if we just compare um, how much of our uh, energy storage material we would need for a passive house, um, then we would need 70 cubic meters for sensible and only seven cubic meters for thermochemical energy storage materials uh, with latent storage materials being kind of a middle route. Um, and so uh, to get a little bit into the mechanism of thermochemical energy storage materials, we've got one nice example, magnesium oxide. And that's basically our charged battery. And what happens when we add water, um, this, salt, this salt, we can think of it as being very thirsty, or we can say we're, we're burning the salt with water, uh, if you like that kind of comparison. Um, and then we get our magnesium hydroxide, which is our battery in its uncharged state. Um, and we get a nice amount of energy released. And this can be, when, when would we like to um, get our heat? Maybe in somebody's basement during the winter for heating purposes or also for district heating. Uh, maybe somewhere in the industry they need uh, to heat their bricks up to 800 degrees in the oven and we can use part of the, um, this uh, TCM or thermochemical energy storage material to uh, heat the process. And then to charge the battery again, uh, to remove the water, then we can use heat from um, solar, if we've got a peak of solar energy production, let's say in uh, Sevilla in Spain at 40 degrees in mid-July or something, um, and then we can also use it for seasonal energy storage, meaning that uh, the batteries that are charged in the summer uh, can then be used in the winter when it's a bit colder. And so the, the TCMs have yeah, very nice storage densities compared with things like latent or sensible heat storage. We've got a nice wide range of operating temperatures, also lossless storage, um, and we can also transport them. So um, theoretically, if we have a factory that's producing a lot of waste heat and we can harness this waste heat to recharge our batteries, then we can do the other step at another location that needs this heat. Um, so then there's the question, what are the thermodynamics like? Um, so basically, just for this reaction of the hydration of magnesium oxide, then we see we've got, yeah, it's, it's not bad, um, two megajoules, um, which is a lot of energy. I mean, it's only 4% of the gravimetric specific energy of methane, uh, so we're not going to be replacing methane just by uh, burning magnesium oxide with water, or hydrating it, actually. Um, but the nice thing is we will be more sustainable, hopefully, and we also have a fully reversible reaction, and there's no CO2 involved. So we've got a definitely different application in mind. Um, and so one feature that I'd really like to underscore is the lossless storage, which paves the use for long duration energy storage, um, which isn't just for um, a couple days, but for years, for seasons, uh, you name it. And that can accompany wind or solar, or um, it can even be right at the consumer, depending on the use case. And so the question is, um, as a research group, what are we doing? How are we going to start our search for such thermochemical energy storage materials? Um, and what we did uh, a few years back was develop a novel database search algorithm. And we consulted the HSC database, um, which is a list of thermo uh, thermodynamic properties of reactions. We've got 
um, only solid gas reactions, so we can nicely separate our two uh, components. Um, and we limited it to industrially available gases like water, CO2, oxygen, SO2, and ammonia. Um, and there were about 3,000 reactions to be considered. Um, and you'll see a, a slight a selection of those. And we've got, you know, a lot of data to manage, and we can't run 3,000 in-depth experiments in the lab, so first we chose to exclude the poorly reversible reactions where we thought that this is going to be like a combustion reaction, basically irreversible under normal conditions. Um, and then we were able to select them according to energy density, kinetics, material cost, toxicity. And um, just as an overview, we see that um, we've got our energy content in megajoules per kilogram on the y-axis and the equilibrium temperature of the reaction, uh, which is, you know, correlates to the actual application temperature. Um, if we look at the, you know, closer to room temperature, we've got things like uh, hydrates and hydroxides. We've got things like ammonium complexes. But if we want to go for higher temperature applications, then we can really um, use, you know, oxygen just to oxidize something at, uh, almost 1,500 degrees for very high temperature applications. Um, yeah. And so one of the first ones that we looked at actually in the lab um, was magnesium oxide with the hydration reaction to magnesium hydroxide. And basically, there are a lot of things that can go wrong if you don't know what you're doing in designing this kind of reaction because Particle morphology, specific uh, surface area, and even impurities play a key role in the actual reactivity of our thermo thermochemical energy storage system. Um, and then even just industrially, we've got three different main kinds of magnesium oxide. We can calcinate it all the way up to 2,000 degrees, or maybe only 700 degrees, and that also plays a huge role. Uh, and just looking quickly at some uh, scanning electron microscopy, then we see that if we've got, you know, a, temperature of 1300 degrees in the calcination, then we have a way different particle morphology and porosity. Um, and we also managed to uh, verify in situ using uh, a calcination in XRPD experiments. Um, there we see our nice magnesium oxide peak uh, coming up at around yeah, after 300 degrees. So we can actually see that instead of using industrially uh, prepared magnesium oxide, which is not quite as porous as we would like it to be at 700 or 2,000 degrees. We can actually just um, establish our own calcination protocol at yeah, 300, 350 degrees. Um, and we see here we've got our BET surface um, in uh, dependency on the calcination time. We've got three different temperatures. So looking at the 350 degrees, we see that actually um, we have a slight increase of our surface area with calcination. At 375 degrees, we also have fairly uh, useful surface areas, but if we go all the way up to only 600 degrees, then, wow, it's, it's really only about 10%, 20% of the surface area, and that's not usable for our reactions. Um, so at least we got this hurdle out of the way. We figured out how to get to our magnesium oxide that can be useful. Um, but what happened is, uh, if we look at the plot of our conversion to the magnesium hydroxide versus time, um, we did some cycle stability tests and saw that after the first uh, cycle, actually we only got to about 50% conversion, and after six cycles, we were all the way down to 5%. And I mean, for seasonal energy storage, maybe it's okay if you don't have 1,000 cycles that are stable, maybe 100 will be good, because if you can store energy for 100 years, 100 seasons, that's, that's fine enough, but only 4%, that's not gonna get you anywhere. Uh, so our question was, how can we rescue this system? And as is very common in material science and in chemistry, we thought about doping. Uh, so basically, if we're looking at magnesium in the periodic table, um, we can either go up or down for doping, and well, beryllium is expensive and very toxic, so we decided not to touch that um, and use calcium instead. And it was a great idea somehow, but we actually see, if we look at the phase diagram, that they're not really miscible, um, which might be a problem, but the, solu the solution was to use co-precipitation and subsequent calcination uh, to form a mixed magnesium calcium hydroxide um, that we can then uh, make into the oxide. 
So we have the synthesis issue solved, um, but will doping be enough to solve the problem? And what we see here uh, is we've got the calcium content going from zero to 40% uh, along this axis, and then we've got our time of the experiment and also the conversion on the z-axis in this case. And we see that just around 10% calcium, we've got a maximum in reactivity. Um, and actually we have complete conversion here, which is obviously what we wanted to see. And we also did some uh, DFT experiments uh, to see theoretically um, what the effect is of having one calcium atom on the surface, two calcium atoms, and the, we see that yeah, just around one calcium atom on the surface uh, gives us some very nice uh, thermodynamics for the, the water binding. And um, so basically, we've got here our cycle stability tests of our 1% or 10% calcium uh, doped magnesium oxide. And we see here, after two cycles, we're still at 100% conversion. That's what we want. But we also see, with the time, we slowly degrade. So after six cycles, we're only at about 80%. It's still a massive improvement compared with pure magnesium oxide. Um, but the question is, do we have any synthetic strategies or any strategies to overcome this barrier? And we thought about regeneration with liquid water. So we just got our um, spent magnesium oxide doped with a little bit of calcium. We leave it in water overnight. And after 14 cycles, um, after regeneration, the blue um, curves, we see that we also still reach 100% conversion. So obviously it's a next step. Um, it's not a simple system, but we found a way to regenerate it, and hopefully industrially it can also be useful. Um, so we have a success story um, of how we can use just simple wet chemical techniques in order to optimize materials uh, as use as uh, thermochemical energy storage materials. And so we saw we, we've been somewhat successful. Then we ter turned our attention to other uh, systems and other reactions that were present in the database, such as carbonates. We looked at calcium carbonate, magnesium, zinc, cobalt, iron, nickel, lead, um, some with varying success. Um, one problem uh, with, and, and we've got the oxides with also the lead, uh, is that sometimes uh, specific chemical um, or specific crystal structures are formed, which then are irreversible and they cannot react. So um, in the case of carbonates, we want to you know, capture CO2 in the one direction and release CO2 in the other direction. Um, and with the oxides, you know, capturing and releasing oxygen in order to store energy. Um, and, and the nice thing about these, and some were successful, like the uh, cobalt oxide system also has nice cycle stability. Um, we saw basically constant uh, reaction behavior. And so one possible application would then be um, concentrated solar power if you've got you know, um, temperatures of 700, 800 degrees that you're reaching. And yeah, then we were also looking at calcium oxalate, also mentioned as maybe somebody would consider it a MOF, um, and lots of other similar anions we used. If we take calcium oxalate, we've just got two connected carboxylate groups, but if we um, introduce linkers like a methyl group or um, two methyl gr methylene groups um, and such like that, or rings in between, then we have a different amount of water that can be stored in the material. Um, and these investigations are still ongoing. Um, we also looked at the Tutten salts, and yeah, they've got a long formula, but basically it's just um, a couple of cations like potassium, zinc, magnesium, uh, sulfate is the anion, and we've got six molecules of water uh, per um, mole. And so basically what we've got here is the TGA results, the thermogravimetric analysis. Basically as we go from left to right, we heat it up. As we go from top, uh, bottom to top, we increase the concentration of our second um, bivalent cation, here magnesium, here nickel, and here cobalt. And we saw that we can tune the properties very nicely. Um, this is our dehydration window. So if we go uh, with 100% zinc, then yeah, we've got a reaction around 60 to 80 degrees. And if we've got 100% nickel, well, then we increase the reaction temperature by 20, 30 degrees. And any composition in between uh, might be useful for a given industrial application, depending on where they want to store the energy. Um, 
So we were very pleased with these results. And yeah, just to touch on a couple of other experiments we did, we were also looking at ammonium complexes because ammonia is also a nice gas that can be easily separated from solids. Um, and in the case of copper ammoniate or copper sulfate ammoniate, um, there's also water inside, which is interesting. Um, we looked at the energy content of a wide variety of ammonium complexes that we found in our database, and we saw that actually the best energy contents were those of the chlorides, nickel chloride, cobalt chloride, uh, copper chloride, uh, but sulfates were also okay. Um, so the nice thing about the, the ammonium complexes, obviously ammonia is a little bit toxic, but people can deal with it in industry and they don't have any problems, um, as long as they make sure everything's nice and, um, um, nice and closed systems. Um, so basically we were interested in seeing if not for household applications, but for industry, we could also use our ammonium complexes as thermochemical storage materials. And we started off with the best ones, according to the energy content, um, nickel chloride. However, we see, uh, if we look at our thermogravimetry, we see that we have a constantly decreasing mass uh, with each cycle. And that's actually due to the nickel chloride sublimating. So we're actually losing our material as a gas, and that's bad because it's supposed to be a solid. Um, and we were, however, able to um, run the reaction at lower temperatures, reducing the sublimation potential, um, but also reducing our energy storage um, capability. Because if we only have uh, the cycle between one and six moles of ammonia, uh, then we have a little bit less of our reaction going on, a little bit less um, enthalpy. But it's one possible solution. Then, instead of the uh, volatile chlorides, I'd just like to show a quick um, bit about one of the sulfates, um, which are not volatile at all, don't have any sublimation issues. And we see that for copper sulfate, if we've got our uh, tetraamine, uh, tetraamine complex, then we have a really nice reproducible mass change. Uh, you can he heat it up to about almost 200 degrees and nothing uh, gets volatilized, no problems. Um, we looked at some single crystals uh, from methanol. We see our nice hydrogen bonds inside. Um, the problem is though, if you want to build it as a particle inside of a reactor, um, we've got a volume change that afterwards is 260% of the initial volume. And that means either at the beginning the reactor is going to be basically empty and then you add the ammonia and then it'll fill up or else you'll just break the reactor um, or the reaction won't happen. So what we thought about was actually let's just put it on solid supports, um, which is of course going to uh, reduce a little bit our volumetric uh, energy storage density, but going to reduce the volume change problems. Um, so just uh, classic chemistry of adding it onto supports. And we look at our energy content, we see that, um, yeah, it's a, it's a lot lower if we look at on silica with 10 to one weight percent, it's actually not so much lower. Um, we looked at sepia light, sea light, charcoal, and we see that actually if we have it on zeolite 13X, we have no expansion, could be nice. And if we look at our data, we put it into a reactor and saw that, yeah, the energy content is a bit lower, but we still have a maximum peak temperature of 181 degrees just by reaction of copper sulfate with ammonia on our uh, solid support. So we've got a closed, um, closed cycle lab prototype going. Here's the temperature profile. Um, and also got a nice little prototype reactor going. Um, yeah, heat release begins within 20 seconds. And a patent, and that's it. Uh, so thank you so much for your attention. Thanks to everyone on the team. Thanks for uh, everyone here running the Exner lectures and Dr. Stefan Radl for inviting us. And um, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy. Thank you.